Okay. So we left off last time talking about impulse and momentum. I have about another uh, lecture to wrap up uh, that subject. We did uh, kind of an interesting problem last time where we had to use a free body diagram where we're integrating the force over time. Anytime that you have a force over time, you're going to probably think impulse and momentum, whereas if you have a force over distance, you're going to be thinking work and energy. And then I, I wanted to, to look today at some, some classic problems, uh, conservation of momentum problem. So I've got in this case a, a truck that's on a barge. We're told that the truck has a um, velocity relative to the barge of six kilometers per hour. The truck is eight megagrams and we'd like to find the velocity of the barge. Uh, you'll see other uh, uh, examples of this. Uh, someone standing up in a canoe and walking to one end um, or maybe someone standing on a toboggan and walking to another uh, the other end of it. Uh, then you can spice this up a little bit and have uh, two people changing positions in a canoe or a toboggan, or we could have a couple trucks on this barge changing positions. Uh, those those more complicated problems really the, the 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 trick to that is to look at each case individually as one person's walking to the left, figure out what's going on, and then as one person's walking to the right, figure out what's going on and superimpose those on each other. So it's really not much more complicated than this problem. But let's, um, let's go through this. We've got that the empty barge displaces 240 cubic meters of fresh water. So we want to come up with the weight of the empty barge. So that's oftentimes uh, ships and barges are, are described in this matter, how much water they displace. We know from uh, probably basic science that the weight of the barge is going to be equal to the weight of the water that it displaces. Is that right? Okay. So I could say that I have uh, 240 cubic meters of displacement. It seems like a lot for an empty barge, but anyway. And then what's the density of fresh water? It's in fresh water. So we'd have a thousand kilograms per cubic meter okay. is, uh, is one value. You can scale that up or down. So this is going to turn out to be 240 megagrams. Okay, 240 megagrams. If it was uh, salt water, uh, it would either dis uh, it would uh, displace less because the uh, density of salt water is greater. I guess if it was mercury, it would displace way less. Anyway, so we got 240 megagrams. So now what I'm going to do is we're going to neglect friction. which is not a bad approximation. As long as we have a low velocity, neglecting friction is a, is a pretty good assumption. You could go down to the pier and you can actually uh, take and push against a pretty good sized boat and push it out away from the pier uh, because uh, you're, you're, you're exerting it, uh, that, that force with very, very low velocity. So really we're going to go back to M1V1 is equal to M2V2 that we don't have any linear impulse. So we have conservation of linear momentum. And going through this, I'm going to do this a couple different ways. I'm going to say that I have uh, six kilometers per hour. And I'm going to multiply that by the uh, mass of the truck. You have to use mass terms here, which is easy in the metric system. So that'll be eight megagrams is equal to and then I'm going to look at the mass of the barge in the truck, which is going to be 248. Obviously, we get that from 240 plus 8. 248 megagrams times the velocity that we are looking for, the velocity of that barge. And if you go through the solution here, you'll find that the velocity is a small fraction, is equal to 0 0.194 kilometers per hour, which is, is not too bad because we were wanting to have low velocity for our no friction assumption. Now some people might say, well, don't we have to deal with relative velocity and whatnot? Yeah, there's, there's another way that we could look at this. We could say, or, see if I can solve it another way. I'm going to use the exact same equation here. I'm going to divide this up a little bit differently. So I'll treat this as uh, six kilometers per hour. And then I'm going to subtract off the velocity of the barge. And I'll be multiplying this by 8 
megagrams. And I'm going to set this then equal to 240 because I've changed the velocity. I don't have to worry about the mass of the truck. So I just have 240 megagrams times the velocity v. And you can see mathematically, those are just a mathematical rearrangement. It should not surprise us that the velocity then will come out to be the same number, 0 0.194 kilometers per hour. Okay. So I, I don't know that would be good terminology, but one of them is kind of relative velocity. One of them is kind of relative uh, mass. So you could, you could do them either way. Questions with that? Pretty, pretty straightforward problem. You've probably done similar ones in, in physics and whatnot. If there's no question, we'll move on to the next problem. So the next problem is one that you probably have done before, at least heard of. Ballistic pendulum. Wouldn't have to dig too far in a physics book to, to find this, or uh, maybe even did it as an experiment in physics. physics. What we do is we have some target, and we could take, uh, for instance, if we were to just to take a piece of wood or a log or something and, and suspend it. Uh, so this is the, uh, the 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 grain would be going this way, okay, and suspend it by a couple of cables. You could actually suspend it by one, but then you have to concern yourself with rotational effects. So we want to keep this traveling parallel. Uh, so we'll put it by two cables, and then we will fire this uh, bullet into it this projectile and what we're trying to come up with is the I guess we don't want the, the mass of the we're trying to come up with the velocity sorry I get rid of this here as the judge says strike those remarks so we're trying to come up with the velocity of the bullet something that's kinda of hard to do we'll talk maybe at the end about other ways of doing this but a lot of times in engineering, we try and, and measure difficult quantities by measuring other quantities and finding some relationship to that. So this uh, velocity of the bullet, that's something that's going to be difficult to measure. And what we'd like to do is try and be able to measure other quantities that are a little easier to measure. So we're going to fire this thing into this log. Uh, we're going to hope that it gets uh, stuck in the log. In fact, we're going to demand that it gets stuck in the log, that it doesn't have any loss of mass or anything. It is a, what we call a totally inelastic collision. Okay. And because of that, I think you can imagine that uh, the uh, log is going to have some velocity imparted to it, and that will increase the height of the log. The log's going to swing up, isn't it? So I should probably put, I mean, if this is uh, 0.1 here, I should probably not to call this 2, but rather call this 3 and put one in between here that looks like this. So we'll have something like this where it still hasn't moved. Those cables are still hanging straight down, but we have this completely embedded in here, and we have the mass of the log plus the mass of the bullet. We haven't lost any mass along the way. And this has some velocity. It's going to have the velocity of the, uh, the target and the velocity of the, the bullet. Okay. So this would be case number two or point number two in analyzing this. You can imagine if you fired this into, momentarily, this would still be down here, but it would have some velocity. And then this velocity would allow us to move that up to there. And this is an important case because to get from this one to this one, I'm going to use conservation of momentum. And then to get from this one back up to you here, I'm going to use conservation of energy. And someone might say, well, why don't you just use go from one to three with conservation of energy? Does the bullet not have uh, kinetic energy? Indeed it does. And couldn't we convert that into potential energy for raising up the target? Yeah, you could. The only problem is, is across the collision, about 99% of your energy is lost. Okay, to internal energy, heat, things, noise, and things like that. Uh, so while the collision 
is dealt with very well with conservation of momentum. It is not dealt with at well at all with conservation of energy. Okay. Um, maybe if we had a totally inelastic collision, we could talk about conservation of energy. But uh, by definition here, since this is getting stuck in this, we don't have an elastic collision. It's completely inelastic, in fact. Okay. So we're going to use conservation of momentum, and then we're going to use conservation of, of energy. So what's our conservation of energy, or I'm sorry, conservation of momentum equation going to look like? I would have the mass of the bullet times the velocity of the bullet, and what's that going to have to be equal to? The mass of the log plus the mass of the bullet times this velocity v, right? The velocity that this thing's going to have. Okay. So I'll leave that be, and let me talk about the conservation of energy equation. What's that going to look like? Well, we go from, from here where we have kinetic energy, right? Is that what we have there? So I'd have some kinetic energy, and that's going to actually kinetic energy, probably I should say it too, is going to convert to what? Potential energy at three, is that right? Okay. So I'm going to say that I have one half times the mass of the log plus the mass of the bullet or projectile times the velocity. Let me just call that V. Yeah, you should be okay with V. One half MV squared is equal to, what are we going to have? MGH. So this is going to be the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the log times G the acceleration of gravity, so mg, and then what's h in this? That's our distance y, isn't it? Okay. So, let's see, I could figure out that the velocity here is going to be equal to what? The uh, mass of the bullet times the velocity of the bullet divided by the mass of the log times the plus the mass of the bullet. I'll substitute that in up here. So making that substitution then, we have one half mass of the log plus the mass of the bullet times the velocity of the log squared. So I'm going to have mb squared vb squared divided by ml plus mb quantity squared is equal to mb plus ml g times y. Okay, so let's see, I can get rid of, I can cancel this with one of those. And then I'm going to say that I have what? y is going to be equal to, I need to divide both sides by uh, g times mass of the bullet plus the mass of the log. So I'll have g over here, mass of the log plus mass of the bullet. I've got one of those, so this will be squared, right? And then what am I left with? I got a two there, and let's see, mass of the bullet, mass of the bullet squared, velocity of the bullet squared, okay. I saw for the wrong thing, didn't I? Yeah. I mean, presumably we measured y, didn't we? What did I want to solve for? Yeah, the velocity of the bullet. Good. So, I guess this is nice. Okay. But what I would really like is the velocity of the bullet. Okay. So, the 
So I need to solve for this character here, don't I? So the velocity of the bullet is going to be equal to, or maybe I'll say the velocity of the bullet squared. I'll take this piece by piece. I need to multiply by uh, both sides by the denominator there. So I will come up with mb plus ml squared times g times y. And what else am I going to need to do? I need to divide this by the mass of the bullet squared. This is canceled out. And I need to what, multiply both sides by 2. Okay. So if I keep going on this, Okay, so if I keep going on this, I can say that the velocity of the bullet is equal to the square root of the uh, mass of the bullet plus the mass of the log squared times g times y times 2 divided by the mass of the bullet squared, which I could rewrite a little better. This is squared and that's squared, so why don't I take this as the mass of the bullet plus the mass of the log divided by the mass of the bullet, and then I'll just multiply that by the rest of it. This is going to be 2 times g times y. Okay, so there we go. I guess y was correct up there, but uh, we didn't want it. We wanted the uh, velocity of the bullet. So we get the velocity of the bullet by measuring the mass of the bullet. That would be easy enough to do. Anyone with a, you know, a $10 cheapy scale uh, uh, or balance could figure that out. The mass of the log, that might take a little bit larger scale, but that would be fine. Again, with mass of the bullet, that's easy. G, the acceleration of gravity, we can assume that. Or you probably did an experiment in physics to measure that. Uh, you might say, well, why? What's why? That's going to be this distance here. We could come up with some sort of a... Um, uh, mechanism that would have some sort of a dial uh, that this would go up and press up against or you could use some uh, probably just uh, take a video of it and slow it down right okay because that's going to happen a lot slower than the bullet so you could still get a, a good measure of that so I would submit that that's an expression for the velocity of the bullet with quantities that are easy to measure do the units work out in this thing so we have mass let's say kilograms divided by kilograms times the square root of 2 doesn't have any units. G is going to be um, kilogram meters. No, I'm sorry, not uh, kilogram. That's, uh, yeah, just meters per second squared times Y, which is going to be meters. So I end up these two canceling each other, and I have the square root of meter squared over second squared, which is going to be meters per second. So in the metric system, we are good to go on the units would be good in the US system or the English system too. So questions of that? The real uh, key to this problem is in the setting out to make sure that we didn't try and use conservation of energy across the collision. You have to use conservation of momentum there. Well, are there other ways of doing this? Probably. Yeah, one way is They'll have something like this, and they'll have a couple of uh, loops set up. And you uh, fire the projectile through this. Okay, and the, the electrical folks, if you have this uh, loop and you put this uh, iron or lead in it, does that change the inductance of that loop? It does, doesn't it? So we could look at the change in inductance here. We could look at the change in inductance here. And if this is a known distance, we could figure that out, okay? Uh, you, you, if you go to a gun range, you'll probably see people uh, using that. It's always kind of fun when you see them shoot it. Uh, that's always, always kind of neat. So that's one way. Another way, if you say, well, I don't like to use electrical things, I, I want to uh, use mechanical things, is you could have something that is uh, maybe rotating, spinning quite rapidly, and if you were to fire this projectile through it, Okay, 
how far the holes are apart on it based on how fast it's spinning, you could figure out how fast it was going, right? I mean, hypothetically, I'm going to stress hypothetically, if a car was driving past and you shot at the car, the distance between the bullet hole on the right side and the left side would tell you how fast the bullet was going, right? If you knew how fast the car was going. Okay, uh, probably not something you want to do. The, the other way that they actually probably do this in real life, and did you do this in physics? Did, did you t have a ballistic pendulum problem? Yeah, okay, probably didn't use rifles, but you threw something at something, okay. In, in so-called real life, which I think we're all in real life anyway, but uh, maybe you get, you get the idea here. When, when you're out doing this kind of stuff in practice, you usually uh, aren't firing at a log, but you suspend the rifle is one very effective way of doing this, particularly when you're concerned about recoil. And you'll probably then just have some uh, solenoid going up to, to pull the trigger so that you don't have that uh, changing it. And would that give it to you? Yeah, because you'd have the velocity of the bullet and the mass of the bullet, and then you'd have the um, velocity of the gun and the mass of the gun, right? Now you might say, uh, how do you find out how, how high this goes? I said, well, you could videotape it and slow that down. You might say, well, if I'm going to videotape it, I might just videotape the bullet. This is going to uh, rise up a lot slower than the bullet is going. Okay. Um, if you want to start to videotape something like a bullet in flight, that is a, a significant challenge. So when I did research as I was leaving the university, we actually wanted to watch fluid at that kind of speed. And we had a camera. This is back in the video days. It had a, a video cassette about the size of a large pizza, and it would put, uh, I think, 250 feet of uh, tape across the head every second. And so it was zipping along. And you could actually stop a bullet in flight with that. So, uh, you know, nowadays they have electronic ways of doing that, but it's still a real challenge to catch something moving that fast. Anyway, some, some things to, uh, to think about. Questions as we wrap that up? Well, let's try one last problem in this area. So we've looked at things really just going in one direction so far. We've been kind of careful about that. Can things be happening in, in two directions? The answer is absolutely. Let's say that we take a target here that is uh, four kilograms and it's uh, moving at uh, to the northeast, so to speak, at 12 meters per second. And uh, not exactly northeast, but uh, 30 degrees in there. And we have this 50-gram uh, projectile moving at 600 meters per second. And the, uh, the projectile is fired into this and is uh, essentially absorbed. Maybe it's gelatin or something. Although with the relative numbers here, it's going to be really hard not to have this thing just blow it to a million pieces. But uh, anyway, we're, we'll assume that this comes up and hits this. And we have complete retention of mass and it is completely non-elastic. And I think you could, would imagine that it's going to change how this is, is uh, performing or, or acting in both the x and the y direction, right? So if I want to try and figure out what we have in terms of our new velocity, that is the new velocity of the target and bullet. I assume that's a bullet going 600 meters per second. Either that is someone really driving fast. Some miniature person driving fast. Anyway, so so if we look at the uh, new velocity for that target bullet combination, if I look at conservation of linear momentum, And I can do this uh, in the x direction. So why don't I do it in the x direction first? Does the um, does this uh, target have any uh, momentum in the x direction? Yeah, four kilograms times what? Twelve cosine thirty plus. Does the um, bullet have any momentum in the x direction? No, zero. So this is then going to be equal to what? 4 plus 0 
zero five is that right point zero five kilograms is what that fifty grams is so there's the combination and there's our VX that we would like to find right so you can go through this very easily and solve for your VX VX turns out to be equal to 10.26 meters per second so then if I look at the y direction looking at the y direction here I have does our target have anything going in the y direction yes certainly does 4 times 12 sine 30 plus does our projectile have anything going in the uh, y direction it's all in the y direction isn't it so 0 0.05 I gotta be really careful with the units if I'm in kilograms I need to and uh, meters per second I need to stick with that times what 600 is equal to 4 plus uh, 0 0.05 times the velocity now in the y direction so I can say the velocity in the y direction is equal to 13.33 meters per second I think is what that turns out to be so we could put these together if we wanted to we could say that the velocity is going to be the square root of the velocity in the x direction squared plus the velocity in the y direction squared which gives you 16.83 meters per second and let's see if I plot x and y I come over here what do we say we had the x was 10.26 the y is 13.33 there's the vector and we would get this angle in here theta theta is going to be equal to the arc tangent of 13.33 divided by 10.26 which gives us 52.4 so we could say then that we had some velocity 16.83 at uh, 52.4 degrees. Does that make sense? Yeah, we would expect it to start to move in that direction, wouldn't we? I mean, if we were to argue from the extreme, and this was a very heavy, well, which is this is a rather extreme case, but if we were to take the extreme to the next level, make this even heavier, moving even faster, we would think that we could eventually get it all in that direction, couldn't we? Okay. Uh, it's still going to have some in the x direction, though. So it should not surprise us that uh, this starts to move like that. Questions of that? Yeah. We're assuming it's going to hit at the center of mass. You're absolutely right. That would be a nice segue into chapter 16 is where we're going next. Yeah, the rotational sense. Because I think you could imagine just uh, getting everything right and just putting the right English on it and getting the spin right there. Yeah, definitely. So, other questions? Not sure what that was, but uh, <laughs> anyway. So that finished up uh, our work with impulse and momentum. We've got uh, quite a few homework problems to, to help you with. So as we look at uh, transitioning into Chapter 16, or maybe better described as uh, rigid body kinematics, uh, we want to start uh, making our models more robust and looking at situations where we don't think of something as a, as a particle. Uh, if, if we look at a car heading down the freeway, uh, thinking of it as a, as a particle or a point is okay until we want to start thinking about it maybe uh, slipping on ice and rotating end for end or something like that. And then we've got to start thinking of it as a rigid body, as a collection of of particles that are separated by some distance. And, and to this point, I'd like to look at this kind of interesting example, get us thinking about some things, uh, just generally, not necessarily uh, so much with numbers. But um, 
it's happened to us uh, many times. You've got a uh, large uh, uh, industrial chimney. They can be several hundred feet uh, tall, three, four hundred feet tall, and uh, they're um, no longer uh, needed or useful or working, and they want to uh, remove it. So sometimes they'll implode it, and um, they'll, they'll try and get it to come straight down, or sometimes they will, uh, with some explosions, take out a, a side and get it to uh, fall over, um, almost like uh, falling a, a tree, like a lumberjack might uh, bring down a tree in the forest. Well, that second example, that's what I want to, to look at, is what happens when you try and uh, remove this. I mean, you, you, you blow a hole in the side of this, and you're hoping that this thing will rotate over like that. So if you look at this, in most cases, if these are of significant height, they almost always uh, rupture in here. They're usually made out of brick or masonry. They're usually quite old, maybe not uh, reinforced all that well. And they usually uh, rupture like this. And sometimes they'll rupture in a couple spots as they, as they do this. And it's actually really quite predictable because if you look at this, if you look at what's happening here, if we look at um, maybe something uh, pivoting about a, a point, if you will, as this has some angular velocity, omega would be the angular velocity, and it might have some angular acceleration, alpha, then it's going to, uh, at, at points along here, maybe at this end point, we would like to think about the acceleration. This is going to have some a tangential acceleration that's going to be equal to alpha times r. And it would also have some normal acceleration, uh, which would be uh, given as omega squared uh, times r. A couple of things we could think about. And of course, r would be the uh, uh, distance from this, this point out to there. We could uh, define that as r if we wanted to. Now, uh, what happens here, if I'm looking out at this point here, and let me uh, kind of uh, enlarge what's going on there, let's say that we have this uh, tangential acceleration, alpha times r, and there's a vertical component of this, right? I mean, if we look at the vertical component of that, that's that. And there's that vertical component, so this is the vertical component, as that vertical component becomes larger than the acceleration of gravity, what happens? Well, we start to power this thing down, right? Uh, as this is just rotating over, uh, slowly, uh, with a low tangi or tangential acceleration, we're probably in pretty good shape. But as the tangential acceleration gets larger, as this gets larger and larger, the vertical component comes to exceed the acceleration of gravity. Once that exceeds the acceleration of gravity, you're now powering this thing down almost like a fly swatter, and you'll begin to, in this leading edge, develop tension stresses, and in this trailing edge, develop compression stresses. Now, brick, it handles compression quite well, but what about tension? Old, old uh, brick that's been around for a long time, a hundred years or so, it does not handle tension particularly well, and that's why you oftentimes see these things rupture like this. So it's kind of an interesting example. I've had in the past some interesting pictures of this, but for copyright reasons, I, I didn't bring those in. You could probably uh, do a quick Google search and find some of those, and you'll find oftentimes these towers, if they don't bring them straight down, if they try and, um, for one reason or another, um, ha make them fall over, you'll almost always see that uh, rupture there, and that's because the tangential acceleration comes to exceed the acceleration of uh, gravity. Well, we'll um, as we continue working on this, we'll, we'll talk about the um, uh, normal acceleration. We'll talk about the uh, tangential acceleration, but I thought this was a, a good problem to get you to starting to think about this in an introduction to the uh, subject. Well, uh, thank you for uh, watching, and uh, take care till next time.